Hi students. Um, this video is um, designed to help you do some more thinking for your Frankenstein's legacy essay, in particular to think about connections between Frankenstein and romantic art. So I want to show you some things. Um, at the beginning of this video, whoops, I don't want to show you that. I meant to show you um, the instructions for your Frankenstein essay, which are in the modules. And I wanted to show you um, essentially, I'm going to just minimize this for a second. Yeah, I wanted to show you. Um, just to review, I say in your instructions, there are three things you need to do. Um, first, so I put three key responsibilities in the speech you write. First, you need to select one of the following topics related to Frankenstein and make an argument about how the topic is represented or shown in the novel. But um, what I really wanted to point out to you today was that the second responsibility, which is somewhere in your essay, you will need to make an argument in which you compare or contrast how your paper topic or theme is connected to another source from our class, which could be a reading from the Enlightenment um, section or a source um, uh like a piece of art and we're going to talk about um several pieces of art today um so uh when we go over these pieces of art you might be thinking about if you want to use one of them um as you know uh, for that second part of your essay in which you connect frankenstein um uh, and your paper topic um, to another source from our class. And then the third responsibility is to make an argument, maybe in your conclusion, about why your observations matter. And a good way to think about that is how does it relate to the present day? So obviously, um, if you're doing something like science and technology, um, you might think about um, some of the scary science today, you know, some of the science, uh, things like cloning or, um, you know, uh, industries which cause global warming. Um, other, other indications in our world that um, suggest that maybe some of the concerns of romantic artists like uh, Mary Shelley are, are valid concerns. Um, so those are just things to think about. But I did want to point out that second piece about connecting to an outside source, because I think maybe, I hope, this video will help you give you some ideas about that piece. The other thing I want to show you is um, in week, I think it was week five or week four, I'm scrolling down on modules. Um, there was a great little video about romanticism from the School of Life. Um, and you might want to review that. Watch this video about romanticism from the School of Life. Um, you might want to review that to kind of remind yourself how Frankenstein, the novel, sort of fits into the larger context of romanticism. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to point out again um, that the PowerPoint slides I use in these videos are available to you um, on our modules page. Um, you won't see unit three and four PowerPoint slides yet, um, but the Enlightenment and the Romanticism ones are right here for your review. So you might use those as resources too as you think about. Um, uh, your Frankenstein legacy paper. So I'm going to download this one and open it up and talk about it a little bit. I'm a little worried it's not going to be shared. So I'm going to stop my share and then I'm going to reshare. Let's see. that worked and um 
So I'm just going to talk about a few um, pieces of romantic art. Um, we're going to watch a couple of videos about some pieces of romantic art, which also mentions some other pieces of romantic art. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a lot of ideas about how you can connect Fran Frankenstein to other sources in our class. Um, and obviously, if you want to connect it to more than one, that's great. That's fine. Um, all right. So we've talked about how this unit of the class is called the struggle for power. Um, and we've talked um, in the past, but I just want to review some of the characteristics of romanticism we've discussed. Um, a good way to think about romanticism, it's, it was that it's a struggle against enlightenment ideas. So if you remember correctly, uh, or if you remember, um, when we talked about the enlightenment and the enlightenment, everybody was really excited about science and pursuing truth. They were uh, reacting to feudalism and it was really exciting to think of an individual pursuing knowledge on their own and, and knowledge and science and spreading knowledge um, and, and spreading scientific thought uh, you know, was was really um, what people were excited about during that age. And in a way, um, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, those were uh, attempts to um, apply enlightenment thought to uh, governments and the way um, we develop our, our societies. Um, but in the Romantic period, there was sort of a pushback against the idea that all knowledge is good, that all science is good, that all technology is good, and an attempt to reconcile um, the value of rationalism and enlightenment and empiricism with kind of um, the human condition and um, you know day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think we've met, I've mentioned in earlier videos, um, this uh, painting, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich um, is sort of seen as a uh, sort of the epitome of romantic art. We've still got this idea of this individual alone pursuing truth and knowledge, um, but he's sort of, in the face of this great mysterious landscape where not everything is knowable. And a lot of enlightenment art, things are very clear. If you think about the oath of the Horatii, um, you know, the, the soldiers were making their oath. They were going off to do a noble, uh, to fight for a noble cause. Um, in Romanticism, and in romantic art in general, there's a lot of murkiness. There's a lot of mystery. Um, there's a lot of stuff that science and rationalism uh, can't get to, can't explain. Um, and you might think about, I mean, one way to think about it, because Frankenstein is such a great example of romantic art, um, you know, when Victor Frankenstein creates this human, he thinks of it as a very kind of linear, rational thing. But of course, that human comes with needs, needs for a companion, need for a way to live his life, um, all sorts of sort of um, needs that are beyond being able to eat and sleep and function, right? So that's, um, in the Romantic period, artists were really wrestling with all these things we need as humans, all these um, aspects of life that we can't necessarily always define um, in the framework of science. So that's um, one way to think about that. Um, and just a reminder, characteristics of romanticism, nature is a huge deal in romanticism and all these paintings we're looking going to look at, nature is huge. And you might remember feeling that way when you were reading Frankenstein. A lot of times Victor Frankenstein is traveling and he's talking, he's talking about the landscape all the time, right? And its effect on him. Um, in the romantic period, um, you know, there was a real emphasis on the importance of nature and the natural world to work out problems 
think through ideas and feel all things. And there was also a real emphasis on what was called um, the sublime. And the sublime is sort of the combination of beauty and terror you might feel when you're out in nature. So you may be awestruck by the beauty of nature, but, but you could also uh, be a bit terrified by it. If you think of a tornado or a hurricane or an earthquake, you know, there's in the sublime, there's also this sense of um, threat and that we um, maybe cannot control everything. Uh, uh, we cannot control nature entirely. And often that was meant, you know, talking about geography, but you might also think in Frankenstein, um, you know, uh, Victor Frankenstein and the creature um, have this sense of like, being out of control um, and definitely the creature, right? Um, he doesn't intend to kill William, but you know, he's grappling with what to do. Um, so there are sort of forces inside them in human nature that are also um, maybe out of our control. And that idea is a very romantic idea. Um, all right, so we looked at this picture earlier too. It's it's hard to see what's going on in this picture, but um, I'm gonna remind you, this is a train right here. This is um, the solitary uh, reaper. Excuse me, this is not the solitary reaper. This is Rain, Steam and Speed, the Great Western Rail Railway by Turner. Um, and you might wonder, when you find out what's in this uh, painting, whether that title is kind of ironic. Um, does he really think the, the railway is great? Because um, it's hard to see on this slide, but in this picture, which uh, what's ac actually happening is um, this train is about to hit a rabbit. Um, so it's very much a picture about, um, about you know these trains literally running down nature, um, and in the Romantic period, um, you know there was a huge amount of industrialization going um, happening. There was a huge amount. Uh, there were a huge amount of technological advancements, and a big one was the railway and people being able to travel by, by train, um, and uh, people were concerned about this, you know, what is this doing to us? People were concerned about technology, industrialization, and the loss of land. They were, you know, um, moving away from farms in the country to work in the cities. And there was a real sense um, that something important was being lost um, when we as humans move away um, from the land. Um, and J.M.W. Turner was a great um, romantic uh, artist. Um, and he was kind of, he was very concerned about industrialization and very concerned about technology and social issues. I mean, one way to think about um, artists and others in the romantic period is that they were sort of our first environmentalists. They were the first people to say, hey, hey, um, where's this all going? And we've got to all remember, um, you know, the importance of nature and that we can't control all of it. And, um, and, and that, you know, we need to stay connected to it. Um, this painting, which uh, is, um, it's kind of hard to see also on this slide. It's sometimes called the slave ship, but the full title of it is slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming on. Um, Turner was an abolitionist and he uh, was very much against the slave trade and he expressed that in this painting. And I'm gonna play you a little video here within this video. Um, in which a couple art historians describe in more detail what's going on in this painting.
I hope. We're standing in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, in front of what we know as Turner's slave ship. I'm a little worried this isn't going to get shared, so I'm going to try, I'm going to reshare, and I'm going to restart the video. The full title of this work is Slave Ship, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, Typhoon Coming On. You know, when we first come across this painting, it looks really beautiful. It's got oranges and reds, and we see that typical Turner sunset. We're lost in the thick sensuality of the paint. But then my eye goes to the bottom right hand corner, and in a moment of horror, I see a foot and a leg and a shackle in chains and all of a sudden it's not a seascape and it's not about a sunset and it's not about light on the water or not only about those things anymore there's real carnage right in front of us in fact in the closest part of the painting towards us so we're looking at a image of a slave ship that we can see in the distance this is a ship carrying slaves and a typhoon has come on this is based on a poem but we know that this is something that happened in reality and not just once but many times with a storm coming the captain of the ship decided to throw the slaves overboard apparently that was the only way you could collect the insurance if the slaves died of illness or other things while on board the captain of the ship couldn't claim insurance so what he's done is he's thrown the slaves overboard and that's what we see happening it is really horrifying we only see parts of their bodies and there's a swirl of waves and colors and again there's this mixture of the beauty of nature the power of nature and this horrific human act that is within the context of a much wider horrific human act of slavery. We do have this sense of divine retribution, the storm coming for that slave ship that's been dealing in human lives and the punishment wreaked by nature is justified on that ship. But there's also a sense of the total indifference of nature because the same storm that's going to overcome that slave ship is also going to drown the slaves themselves. Nature is completely indifferent different to the human endeavors, whether they are good, evil, otherwise, whatever. So the first owner of this painting was the great Victorian art critic John Ruskin. Then the painting made its way to Boston to an abolitionist, to someone who believed in and struggled for the ending of slavery. Now, the British had outlawed slavery in 1833 in the colonies. The French do it in their colonies 15 years later. But of course, in America, slavery isn't outlawed until the Civil War. So slavery, we have to remember, is still a really active political cause at this moment. This idea that human beings could do this to each other, not just in the form of actual slavery, of buying and selling human beings, but also in terms of taking advantage of one another just for the sake of money. And of course, that's the kernel of this hideous act that the captain engages in here. When we look into the left quarter of the painting, we see some really different colors than what we see in the rest of the painting whites and blues and purples and grays. Ruskin wrote, purple and blue, the lurid shadows of the hollow breakers are cast upon the mist of night, which gathers cold and low, advancing like the shallow of death upon the guilty ship as it labors amidst the lightning of the sea, its thin masts written upon the sky in lines of blood. Okay, um, so uh, one of the reasons uh, I wanted uh, to look more closely at this painting is because this idea of the indifference of nature, there's this beautiful sunset going on in this picture. Um, and at the same time, there's this incredibly horrific, um, you know, act being performed, throwing these people overboard. Um, and 
you know, there's a sense many times in Frankenstein of that kind of indifference of nature. One time that comes to mind is when Frankenstein falls asleep on the boat and ends up in a storm and gets washed um, to Ireland and then is accused of murder, um, of murdering Clerval. And there's this sense of, you know, he's powerless over nature and nature doesn't sort of care about his predicament. And that is sort of a very romantic idea too, that nature is big and powerful and not necessarily um, concerned with human suffering. There's no justice, it's just, um, this big, uh, powerful force. Um, I also wanted to show you this painting by John Constable. It's very different from the Turner. Um, Constable made a lot of paintings, um, and we're very lucky because they're right here in Pasadena. You can go to the Huntington Library and see them. I've been thinking, oh, I should do that. I should go in the next couple of weeks. Um, he has a series of paintings, landscape paintings called the Six Footers because they were six feet uh, long. And, um, and in these landscapes, um, he writes about, um, he, or he paints, excuse me, um, you know, very no, knowable places, places where he was from. He wasn't you know, painting grand history paintings like we saw in their Oath of the Horatii or something. He was painting, this is where I come from. This is my land, my home. And you might think about in Frankenstein, um, how Frankenstein, when he, whenever he goes home, the landscape sort of brings him peace. The familiarity of home, um, uh, was really important to him. And that idea of home bringing us peace, of our home landscape being important to us, um, is a very romantic idea. And so I'm going to play you another video. I may have to reshare again. I think I will reshare again once this gets going. <laughs> We're in the Huntington Library and we're looking at one of John Constable's six paintings that are called the Six Footers. These are large scale landscapes. We're in the Huntington Library and we're looking at one of John Constable's six paintings that are called the Six Footers. These are large scale landscapes. And Which was a radical idea. Oh, it was right a really there. radical idea. Right. Landscape was not considered a high genre of art at all. Landscape was close to the bottom. And this was a scale that was appropriate for history painting. So Constable's immediately making a statement about the importance of landscape painting. And interestingly, not painting an Italianate, classical, timeless landscape, but very much his own landscape of his native Suffolk. This is where his father's farm was. And so this was an environment that he was extremely familiar with. And, and it's not at all ideal. It feels like a specific time of day, a specific season, a specific kind of weather. And in fact, Constable, we think, is the first artist to take weather seriously and to study meteorological books. And the trees are so specific, the foliage is so specific, you can actually determine what kind of foliage this is. It looks like either a storm is approaching or it's just past. You can almost feel the coolness of the breeze. There's something very rough and tactile. It's a beautiful, ideal, pastoral English. English landscape, but at the same time, it's filled with qualities of the mud of the river and the plants growing by the bank, but you can feel it. And this is a painting that is about landscape, but it's also filled with vignettes. You have men pulling and pushing. You can see two barges in the canal and somebody who seems to be pushing them apart to maneuver one of these barges past the other. The white horse on the left is at rest uh, mm -hmm. and the men are doing the labor here. That's true. And then across the footbridge we see a woman carrying a baby bathed in sunlight another figure doing some washing in the river and another couple of figures just beginning to move on to that footbridge and then in the distance a sail on a boat and then a sail on another barge and then in the further distance the church and it's clearly an important part of this painting, the English Anglican church. And so there's a real sense of timelessness that this is a kind of cycle of life ordained by God and 
will continue forever. I agree. It is timeless, but it's also full of particularities. The clouds of the types of trees, right. of the work of the men. Of and, the weather. and even in the foreground, we see a rake, some water lilies in the lower left, the right. particulars of the reflection in the canal but itself. But it's a kind of idea of a particularity that should exist, one feels, That's forever right. and ever. But what's actually happening to British society at this moment, this is the Industrial Revolution, and with trains, these kinds of barges are no longer going to be that useful to transport grain to the cities, to the markets. The price of food had fallen, and there was real unrest in the countryside itself, fires, major political unrest that had the aristocracy and the landowners, like Constable's own father, really fearful for the future of England. So is this a kind of denial then, or a kind of nostalgic view to a fleeting present and perhaps really even a past? Well, and Constable's own past, his own sense of his boyhood, his own nostalgia. I think there's both a personal nostalgia for the place that he grew up, a feeling that many of us know very well, but also a nostalgia perhaps for that, a sense of an England that was disappearing. <laughs> Okay, so um, so one thing to think about if you decide you might want to write about Constable is that sense of a particular place um, and how that might uh, connect to Frankenstein. One of the things we see a lot in Frankenstein is that generally speaking, when Frankenstein is home, he's fine. Um, he talks a lot about the landscape calming him, um, but every time he goes to the city, he gets in trouble. That's where he, um, uh, you know, creates the creature. That's where he destroys um, the companion for the creature. Um, you know, so um, there's really a sense of home and the landscape of home is restorative. Um, and that might connect very well to Constable. And then the final um, piece of romantic art I wanna talk about in detail is this, I just love this painting. I think it's so beautiful. Um, called The Monk by the Sea by Caspar Friedrich. Um, and I think, I'm not gonna say too much about it. I'm gonna show you another video, but, um, but notice that it's, you know, it's one small figure in this huge landscape. Um, one small figure um, that sort of seems powerless against this huge landscape. Um, we still have this notion of the romantic, uh, autonomous, independent thinker, um, but look how overwhelmed he is by the landscape. And you might think about how that relates to Frankenstein. And actually, I think they touch on Frankenstein. In so much 19th century painting, figures in that active narrative, a kind of story before us, and we watch them as if we're an audience looking into this space. But with the work of Caspar David Friedrich, so often he gives us a small lone figure. And instead of looking towards that figure, we in a sense become that figure, and we begin to see what the figure sees. And that's exactly what we have here in The Monk by the Sea, which is in so many ways a really radically modern, pared down image. We have this vast sky and it takes up the preponderance of the canvas. It looks cold and it's clear at the top, these wisps of the clouds, but then it becomes much darker and much more menacing. The ocean below looks freezing cold, it's almost black. We just make out large swells of the waves. And then below that, the cold winter dunes, presumably near Greifswald in northern Germany. This is the Baltic coast, and we see that monk below the sea's horizon line. And because the figure that we're looking at is a monk, we associate that figure with questions of the spiritual. And so we immediately turn our thoughts in that direction. 
He is caught in those narrow bounds of the earthly. He is below the horizon line, but he is aware, and we then become aware of the vastness of the spiritual realm of the sky above, but also the threatening nature of the world in which we inhabit. Those white caps are just picking up the tops of what are really substantial waves, and we can feel the power of nature, the power of that ocean. And I think that notion of the sublime was a very important idea at the end of the 18th and in the 19th century. This is an ancient idea that was revived probably most famously by Edmund Burke in England. The idea was that there is a kind of beauty that is actually awe-inspiring through its power and its terror. And that was a way of directly confronting God's presence in our world. It's both the vastness of nature and the smallness of man and the powerlessness of man. And this figure seems to look toward the right. We know originally that Friedrich had painted a ship on the horizon, which certainly would have made this scene much more mundane. You know, the 19th century is the time most associated with man's control over nature. And this is a kind of antidote to that. This is saying, no, in fact, nature is far greater than us. Our technological advances are allowing us to feel as if we have conquered nature. Here is a humble reminder that the opposite is really true. It's right around this time that Mary Shelley is writing Frankenstein, where man has the ultimate power of creating life like God. And Dr. Frankenstein is punished for the pride that makes him think he can rival God. And so I think it's really true that at this moment, at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, we have a sense of our own power. And at the same time, we question that power. You know, in the 19th century, I think one of the key questions is how can the grandeur and power of God, of spirituality, be represented in our more scientific, more industrialized culture? So the monk by the sea is meant to be seen with a pendant, and in fact is currently hung in the museum just to the left of the abbey in the oak wood. It's a wonderful pairing of paintings because they're both deep winter, and the monk that is so contemplative in the monk by the sea is thought to have been the figure that is being carried in the coffin in the abbey in the oak wood. Uh, so they make a nice connection with uh, Frankenstein in that uh, video. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you might just think about um, in that painting, that whole idea of how relatively powerless a human being is uh, in the face of nature. Um, and, uh, and of the isolation, we have sort of two protagonists in Frankenstein. We have the creature and we have Dr. Frankenstein. Um, and they're both kind of isolated. Um, Dr. Frankenstein is isolated by his shame and his the secret of what he's done. The creature is isolated because no one will come near him um, and he can't get a companion. Um, and um and you know that sense of nature overwhelming um you know when frankenstein uh, creates the creature he thinks he's conquered nature but has he really um and uh it's also interesting to note that frankenstein ends in the cold and the ice right um, so there's a sense of the harshness, the threat, the deadliness of nature um, to humans. So um, those are connections you might make with that um, work of art. Um, let's see. Um, I think that that is pretty much uh, what I wanted to share with you about romantic art. If you have any questions about your essay, about any aspects of this assignment or the class, I encourage you to reach out to me.